Uh, when we speak of foreign terrorist fighters, uh, I think the first thing to acknowledge is the fact that it's not something that is entirely new. Uh, it's a phenomenon that has manifested uh, on the continent for uh, quite a while. But um, what is perhaps unique uh, is the fact that um, the kind and the nature of challenges that it presents on multiple levels. So that is something which uh, perhaps needs to be uh, uh, emphasized a bit further. And um, you know, by the end of 2017, the African Union actually recognized a potential threat of an estimated 6,000 uh, returning fighters, um, uh, individuals who had left the continent of Africa and uh, joined the camps of ISIS in places like Syria and Iraq as far back as 2014 and 2015. Now, th the fear is that some of these returning fighters to the continent uh, actually may join uh, the groups they were uh, members of. And um, the problem now is that we've actually seen evidence from the past where uh, groups like Boko Haram around 2009 had followers who left the group and fled outside the country, they, they left Nigeria, and some of them returned. And uh, you know, upon their return to the country, they rejoined uh, the group under the leadership of Abu Bakr Shekau, and that renewed the audacity of the kind of, you know, the kind of attacks which began to occur. So for instance, we began to see suicide attacks, and the first one which occurred in June 2011, and thereafter we've seen hundreds of that. Now, not all foreign fighters uh, would eventually uh, reunite with the groups they were members of. We have those, of course, who, uh, upon uh, reaching places like Syria, uh, became disenchanted. And then when they return or they relocate to a third country, uh, they don't necessarily join groups, but they or sometimes they wish to, uh, you know, be reintegrated into their communities. But we find that, you know, there are, I mean, there's a range of challenges that they also face. Uh, in most cases, we find some governments, uh, you know, most likely prosecuting them. Uh, there are those who would most likely be rejected by communities where they, uh, they are members of. And of course, others still who would uh, most likely be rejected by their families. And then we also have another set of challenges when we speak of reintegration of these fighters. Um, of course, the needs of some of these individuals needs to be uh, you know, assessed. Uh, the communities where they will be absorbed into uh, also need to be prioritized, the fears and the concerns of those in those communities. And then, you know, the gender dynamics as well. All these need to be considered. And these are the kind of challenges which, you know, this phenomenon presents. Now, I'll start with, uh, you know, definitional terms. Um, we have a number of definitions when we talk of foreign terrorist fighters. Um, there is one by the UN, of course, and there are scholars who have also talked about this. Um, a very good example is uh, the one by someone called David Mallet, and he defines foreign fighters as non-citizens of conflict states who join insurgencies during civil conflicts. Now, the key term in that definition is non-citizens, for example. So when you invoke the notion of non-citizens, it underlies the assumption that we are talking about the contemporary state system, where you have formal borders that divide you know, people. But what we find in, you know, in reality in Africa is that a number of countries on the continent actually have borders that are not clearly defined. You, know, uh, you have arbitrary creations from the colonial period or of the colonial period. And the consequence of this is that um, we find ethnic communities and uh, you know, members of these uh, ethnic groups that can be found on either side of the border. So you take, for instance, the Lake Chad Basin. You find the ethnic group uh, known as the Kanuri you know, in northeast Nigeria, Borno states. You find members of that community in Nigeria. And also, when you cross the border, you find some of them in Chad and in Niger. You go to the east, uh, eastern part of Africa, the Horn of Africa, you find that uh, you can also see uh, individuals in the coastal parts of Kenya who actually share ethnic ties with Somalia and those in the Ogaden region of Ethiopia, you know, having that uh, affinity. And, you know, it raises the question of what really is foreign? You know, to what extent can we, you know, have a watertight uh, definition of, of this foreignness, you know, and you know, you, go, you can even go further and ask the question of what kind of policies do we need to look at in terms of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when we want to address this problem. If we don't get the concept right, especially in relation to Africa, then how, to what extent can we be successful in implementing policies?
Now, that's a very good question. And I think we need to start from even looking at the UN Security Council resolutions. So you take, for instance, um, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2178, which was uh, passed in 2014. And then you had a follow-up resolution 2396, which was passed in 2017. Now, in between those years, uh, we had what was known or what is, what is actually known as the Madrid Guiding Principles, which was uh, adopted by the UN Counterterrorism uh, Committee in 2015. Now, collectively, these uh, resolutions and the guidelines, they draw the attention of member states to things such as uh, ensuring that borders uh, are checked, you know, finding, you know, trying to ensure that states are able to regulate uh, what happens across their borders or within their borders. D they draw the attention of states to things like ensuring that uh, they implement biometric procedures. Um, they draw the attention of states to things like ensuring that they exchange operational information and financial intelligence. You know, states need to also have watch lists and databases. So these are the things which uh, you know, these resolutions draw attention to. But the, the, the real challenge comes in when you look at the reality again. These resolutions are actually limited, you know, in terms of, you know, the extent to which implementation can be successful, especially when we look at some African countries that are affected by uh, violent extremism or even the foreign fighter problem. So you look at high-tech biometric procedures, for instance, only a few countries may be able to implement that. Um, some may, but the, I mean, the vast majority will have challenges in trying to uh, you know, use high-tech uh, detection technology. Um, you look at some of these countries, and in the present day period, a number of them are actually still struggling with uh, having infrastructure, uh, you know, things related to power supply, for instance. So implementing these resolutions, even though there are, uh, there are, best, I mean, there are best practices, and even though they're actually inspired by, uh, you know, good intentions, you know, you find that implementation uh, is always a problem because the practical, uh, you know, the reality is not, uh, you know, in line with what uh, is being proposed. To counter this threat or this problem, um, a number of things can be done. Um, I'll mention just three. Um, first, there is a need for African states and indeed institutions on the continent to be more proactive when it comes to sending practical recommendations, for instance, to the global institutions like the UN. So I talked about uh, the UN Security Council resolutions and the, the Madrid Guiding Principles. And I also highlighted the fact that there are certain blind spots when it comes to implementation in Africa. So African states and institutions need to be more proactive in making practical and realistic suggestions in reviewing these guidelines. And I think this is where, fortunately, we have uh, the Institute for Security Studies, for example, um, which has uh, been very active in terms of trying to make uh, practical recommendations to the Counterterrorism Committee uh, Executive Directorate. In fact, just this week, um, I believe on Tuesday, we had a, there was a briefing at the UN headquarters that was really focused on trying to review some of these guidelines, you know, so it matches reality. So the proactiveness is very important. And even the ISS, the Institute for Security Studies, was also very active at a recently held uh, high-level conference in Doha, Qatar. Um, I happened to be at that conference and um, there were conversations around these issues and a lot of, uh, you know, talk about how there is a need to not just address this problem but in a way that is pragmatic. Now the second thing which um, I believe can be done is to try and address some of the socio-economic uh, deprivation issues in the countries affected and indeed countries in Africa in general. So we find that some individuals who join terror groups or who leave the shores of their country or the borders, cross the borders of their countries, do so because um, they find themselves marginalized within their countries. They find that um, they do not feel a sense of belonging to the, you know, in the polity. So as a result, they, they, they search for some kind of connection with the bigger cause you know, from their own point of view. So if problems related to uh, you know, the socioeconomic challenges, you know, the poverty issues can also be addressed, um, to a large extent it will reduce the vulnerability of societies and individuals who uh, feel the need to leave and join these groups.
Now, a third and final um, thing which can help is trying to also address the ideological aspect linked to this problem. Now, we do know that not everyone who is poor or who is socioeconomically deprived will join a terror group. There's evidence to prove that. And um, as a result, we find another category of individuals who are pulled to terror groups or to join terror groups as a result of the ideological uh, you know, factor. So we find, for instance, individuals who feel that there is a greater cause outside their country to create a caliphate and then they feel they need to resign their jobs or to maybe perhaps just travel, leave their families and join these groups outside the country. So the ideological component of this needs to be addressed and states in Africa need to uh, have national action plans on countering violent extremism that are comprehensive enough to engage local actors on the ground. And local actors, for instance, like Islamic clerics, who are you know, uh, familiar with the essential doctrinal elements that are required to deconstruct the kind of ideological narrative that are pushed by terror groups. So um, I'll just end by saying that the problem linked to foreign fighters and the wider problem of violent extremism is one which isn't going away very soon. It's going to be around for a while, but with sustained efforts and most especially multilateral efforts by states, um, it's something which can be, uh, you know, at least controlled to some extent. And I think this is where states need to uh, work together because a single state can, you know, simply cannot do this alone.